and hello, this is A.W. Anthony Mays, Senior Pastor of the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church, greeting you and welcoming you to our time in the Word, our Bible study broadcast. We're going through currently the book called First Kings, learning history, learning Bible characters, learning circumstances that impact the nation of Israel. We invite you to walk with us in the Word of God. We invite you to worship with us. We are doing in-person worship at the Mount Sinai Baptist Church. We believe we're able to do that safely as we continue to practice CDC guidelines. We wear the facial mask. We do social distancing. We encourage frequent hand washing. We also do temperature reading and screening upon entrance into the building. All of these tactics and that practice has made it so that we've been safely able to gather for in-person worship, and you are welcome to come and join us 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings in the sanctuary, and Wednesday evenings you also have an invitation, midweek worship, 7 p.m. Our church address is 8500 Cameron Road. We're located on the north side of the city of Austin. Very convenient that you might discover where we are and come and join the people of God in the worship of God. We invite you to discover us on the internet, www.themount.com. Dot net is our church website. Much information is available for you there to learn of our ministries, to learn of our schedules, to learn of ministry opportunities, history of the church, persons who share as a part of our staff. So much information available that you're welcome to just browse the information. And we invite you also to take advantage that you might uh, email Pastor Mays. We have email address that is designated that if you want to communicate with us, if you want to write concerning questions, uh, Bible study, we'd be very happy to respond back to your email. And that email is P-A-S-T-O-R-A-W-M-A-Y-S. That's Pastor A W Mays at themount.net. Love to hear from you. Would respond back as quickly as possible to communicate with you in that way. We're in Bible study. I love Bible study. Bible study is a time where we come unto the Lord seeking greater knowledge, uh, greater power, greater understanding of our God and of His Word. We accomplish that through three step strategy for Bible study. That is, first of all, in preparation, pray. Settle yourself. Quickly but sincerely ask God to open your eyes, to give you understanding, to grant unto you wisdom that you might be able to understand and receive according to his word. And we ask that the first step is reading. Each time I share with you, I share with you that reading is essential. Reading is basic, fundamental. You must read God's word. Read it carefully. Open the book and read it for yourself, deliberately, carefully with attention uh, as you read it. Uh, and remember that every English Bible is a translation. And so do not fall for the argument that there's only one Bible translation that's sanctified by God. That was well-meaning, but it was in error because uh, there are many translations that are available and they're very helpful for understanding the English scriptures, which scholars have gone and they have 
search from the original writings, the manuscripts of Hebrew, of Greek, and Aramaic to bring them into our language that we might understand them. I choose first to start with the King James Version, but I share with you that I have many versions available to me, and I take advantage of comparing different Bible versions to help me to have clarity, to help me to have understanding of uh, the meaning in the Word of God. King James translation is originally so very old that sometimes the words and the uh, archaic terms that it uses require special understanding, uh, that we don't speak uh, King James English as they did in the year 1611 when it first was published. But I do want you to know that whatever translation you're comfortable with, that you would use it and that you would turn to it and that you would, step number one, read it. You read it, you get information, you get data. You make observations when you read it. The second step is interpretation or analyzing what it is that I've read. I know what it says, but now, secondly, I must discover what does it mean? What is its message? That's interpreting the scriptures, interpreting the data. And I encourage you to have some Bible study helps of your own. The first step uh, in investing in understanding, I encourage all of you to have your own personal study Bible in one volume. You have so much information available to you in a study Bible. Footnotes, cross-references, chapter headings, outlines, diagrams, articles, histories, concordance, dictionaries. The, the, the wealth of information in one book is that you can carry this one book and you can uh, derive great value from having your own personal study Bible. What does it say? You're seeking to interpret it. That's step number two. And then step number three, very simply, is application. Application. Then you must discover that you must walk in the Word of God. Step by step, let His Word be your guide. Let his word be your light, casting out darkness. Be obedient to the word of God. Those three steps we practice, we do. If you are a beginner, even if you are a professional, these steps can be enlarged and made with more depth according to what you desire to do. But I encourage you to get after it on a regular basis, taking in the Word of God. We're going to have word of prayer at this time. Join with us. Then we're going to ask God to do just those things we've been asking in giving direction for Bible study. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, our God, we ask now that you would bless us in your Word. Teach us. Show us what you would show us in your word, let your word speak to us. Give us clarity. Give us light. Cause us to see. Bless those who are under the sound of our voice. Wherever they might be, whatever they might be experiencing, let them, O oh God, be blessed in your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to begin chapter 21. Get your Bibles and look with us at chapter 21. From chapter 20, we've been focusing on King Ahab. King Ahab, king of Israel, a wicked king, a wicked king. Uh, we've seen uh, Ahab as he has uh, confronted uh, the prophet Elijah. He's married uh, to a woman named Jezebel, a pagan woman who has brought idolatry and the worship of Baal into the kingdom. 
Ahab is a wicked king, and yet God gave him the victory in chapter 20. But in the victory that God gave him in chapter 20, God had decreed that the king should be slain. And Ahab made a covenant agreement with him and allowed him to go free. He's been judged for that disobedience. He has a pronouncement upon him that he would die because of his disobedience. Keep that in mind as we come to chapter 21, yet dealing with Ahab. Verse 1 says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. A vineyard next door, uh, perhaps abutting up against the palace. Note, this man is Naboth, and he has this vineyard that is next door to the palace of the king Ahab of Samaria. Chapter 21, we're going to verse 2. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. Here's the setup. King Ahab sees this next door vineyard belonging to Naboth, and he wants it. He wants to have a garden of herbs for himself. Here is his offer. I'll trade you. You give me this vineyard, and I will trade you a better vineyard at another location. And secondly, the offer is, if you do not want to trade, then I will give you the value of this vineyard in money. I'll just buy it outright. You sell it to me, and I will purchase it. Verse 3, here is the hang-up. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. So this vineyard is part of the inheritance of the family of Naboth. Jewish law, the nation of Israel, understood that the inheritance must not pass away from the family. And this is what Naboth is standing on, that he cannot sell, he cannot trade away the family inheritance. He's standing on the law. He's standing on the principles that have been laid out by God. Verse 4, we learn something about Ahab. And Ahab came into his house heavy, and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. He is sulking. He is in a state of gloom and despair because he wanted something and he's been denied it. He wants something. He feels that he ought to have it and he has had to face a very firm no. Naboth said, I can't do it. He's not saying I don't want to do it. He's saying it is forbidden for me to do it. It would be a sin for me to disregard the laws that have been established by God concerning inheritance. And what does Ahab do? He goes to the palace and he pouts. 
He's displeased. Some people can't handle a no. Some people just feel like it ought to be yes. Some people feel like everything has its price, that it is only when they run into a, a wall of uh, disagreement and uh, difficulty of obtaining what they want that many times they simply cannot handle it. So he's refusing to eat. He is, uh, he, he's, he's being like a child in the sense of throwing a tantrum. Verse 5, but Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? What's wrong with you? Why are you in such a mood? Why are you so gloomy that uh, you have no joy? Verse 6, and he said unto her, because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered and said, I will not give thee my vineyard. That's the reason I am depressed. That's the reason why I'm in this valley, why there's this cloud over me is because I wanted something and I was not allowed to have it. Jezebel, verse 7, his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Don't you know what power you have? Don't you know you rule over this land? She says, Arise, that is, get up, eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I'm going to fix it. That's what she says in verse 7. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. I'm going to fix it. If that's what you want, you are the man with power absolute. And I, I want you to get up off uh, your couch. I want you to eat. And I want your heart to be merry. Because what you want, I'm going to get it for you. Verse 8. So... She wrote letters in Ahab's name under his authority and sealed them with his seal. So the letters that she's writing, she's writing as if they are coming from Ahab with all of his authority and they look authentic because she uses the seal. She sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in the city dwelling with Naboth. Verse 9, she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. Call for a time of fasting and uh, center this Naboth in the middle of this. Verse 10, the further directions in this letter, and set two men, sons of Belial, that is crooked, evil, wicked men, devilish men, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Get to because the biblical principle is in the mouth of two, the truth is established. But these men are of character and of the sort. They don't care about the truth, but they agree together. And look at what they charge against Naboth, that he committed the supreme crime of blaspheming God and blaspheming, blaspheming the king. All oh, terrible sins. Of course, Naboth is innocent, but he's got these two witnesses that uh, are claiming that he has done so. Verse 11. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. So they carried it out. Beware of persons 
who have no principles, that just because a person of power and authority orders them to do something, they still had the free will to disobey and not carry out the evil plot, but they go right along with it. They carry it out very quickly. So here is the carrying out. Verse 12, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. It's all a conspiracy. It is carried out very quickly. Verse 14, Naboth is now dead. He's been stoned to death. Verse 14, then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. Verse 15, and it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. There is the strategy of Satan that if you cannot get what you want, it is not beyond the practice and the certainty, but to kill the person. And so they get rid of Naboth by executing him under false pretenses. 16. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. Now that tells you even more about the wickedness of Ahab. He doesn't question what happened to Naboth. He doesn't question how it is that he is dead and that he is allowed now to take possession and that it is against the laws of the inheritance. He now has possession of that vineyard. Verse 17, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. God sees. God knows. He knows exactly what has been done. He knows where Naboth has been slain falsely, and he knows that Ahab has gone to possess the vineyard. But he calls his prophet Elijah to meet him, confront him. Verse 19, And thou shalt say unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and taken possession? And, and thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lift lick thy blood, even thine. This is the prophecy of doom and judgment, that just as Naboth was stoned and his blood was shed, your blood is going to be licked in that very same place by the dogs. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? Remember, the clash, he's, he still thought that Elijah was his enemy. Elijah is the prophet of God. It is that because Ahab is outside the will of God, giving in to evil, that he still wants to call Elijah the enemy. And he answered, I have found thee because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. You've given over to do evil and wickedness, Elijah tells Ahab. Verse 21, Behold, 
I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel. I am going to rid the nation of you and all of your descendants and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. I want you to know that you brought down upon yourself the same absolute judgment and punishment of kings before you because you sold yourself to wickedness. Verse 23, And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness, in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. He was influenced. He was inspired. He was led by his wicked wife, Jezebel, and he became the pinnacle of evil. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Ammonites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And, listen at verse 27, And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. He's trying to repent. He's trying to show sorrow. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. And so that's chapter 21. Ahab has judgment upon him, but because he humbled himself, perhaps sincerely and genuinely, the Lord held back the judgment of evil past his mortal days. So that concludes all of chapter 21. And when we come together again, we will look beginning at chapter 22. This is a chapter where a man wanted something so badly he was willing to do anything to have it. Be careful of wanting anything so badly that you're willing to break any rule, any law in order to possess it. It cost Ahab his kingdom. Any questions, share with us. But until next time, this is A.W. Anthony Mays bidding you God's peace.